All right, welcome to Unit 2. Uh, unit 2 is all about biochemistry, um, in other words, the chemistry of life. Uh, we'll be covering lots of different things uh, over the course of this unit. Uh, it's going to be a very large unit, a lot of vocabulary. Uh, but in order to kind of get into the real good stuff about how chemistry affects our lives on a regular basis, uh, we need to learn like the basics of chemistry. So that's going to be uh, the focus of section one here. We're going to talk about how chemistry is necessary for life. Now, uh, before we do that, a couple things we've got to get out of the way here. First of all, we need to know that all living things and non-living things even are composed of matter. Now, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. Now, mass is different than weight. Uh, weight is a relative uh, measurement based on the pull of gravity on an object's mass. So, in other words, our weight on is going to be different on each planet because of the different sizes of the planet have different pulls of gravity. But our mass will never change because that's the amount of space that we take up and the amount of stuff in that space. Excuse me. <clears throat> Now, all of that matter is then composed of atoms. Atoms are um, you know, beyond microscopic. You, you have to have a special microscope known as an electron microscope and even in order to be even in order to be able to even see like the outlines and the shapes of atoms. So they're very, very small. Uh, they're in fact, they're the smallest particle of matter that retains all the chemical properties of matter. Okay? Now these are the four sections we're going to cover here: properties of atoms, elements, types of atoms, and bonding. Now, if any of this information is reviewed, that's terrific. Please make sure you write it down uh, and review it as you need. But obviously, if you just need to write it down just as a refresher, uh, then do that and then move on. But anything that's new to you, please make sure you go back over uh, a couple times. Now, properties of atoms. Let's talk about the parts of the atom. Now, first of all, in every atom, there's a nucleus. The nucleus contains two different types of subatomic particles. The first one is known as a proton. Protons have a positive charge. Uh, they have a large mass, but they don't have a lot of energy, meaning they don't move around a lot. The other subatomic particle is known as the neutron. And you'll notice the neutrons have a zero in it. That's because they have no charge. Now, the nucleus as a whole, like I said, does not carry much energy. Uh, there is some vibration that goes on between uh, the different subatomic particles, but it doesn't move around very much. Around the nucleus are the electron shells, or valences. They contain electrons, which have a negative charge. Now, if you know anything about positives and negatives, you know that they attract. Well, it's actually that attraction of positive and negative that keeps the electrons spinning outside the nucleus because they're so full of energy, they would literally just spin off into oblivion uh, if they could. But that pull from these large protons keeps them in place. Now, electron shells are added based on their ability to hold different numbers of electrons. Let me show you what I mean. Now, each row on the periodic table actually represents an electron shell. Okay, so you can see that you can have up to seven electron shells. Now, the first one can only hold two electrons, and that should make sense because there's only two elements on the first row of the periodic table. The second and the third shell can hold up to eight electrons each. Okay, then if I go on to the fourth and fifth, those can hold up to 18 electrons each. Now, the outermost shell of any atom is known as the valence shell, and then the electrons in that shell are known as valence electrons. Now, this is important, obviously, <laughs> with the big red box here. In a neutral atom, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons, meaning that the pluses have to equal the minuses. There can't be a charge in a neutral atom. What are elements? Elements are substances that can't be broken down into other substances by chemical reactions. In other words, I can't take oxygen and break it down further into anything else. There's nothing else in oxygen other than subatomic particles, which is different than something, say, like water, oops, sorry, which has, uh, obviously, hydrogen and oxygen in it. Now, the phrase schnapps is going to be important to you because these are the six elements that are found most often in living things. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. You can see the first four of them, C-H-O-N-N, make up almost 96% of not only humans, but pretty much all organic life forms on the planet. So elements have special properties, and we're going to talk about a couple of those properties. The first one is known as the atomic mass. The atomic mass is just the mass of the atom. Now, you may have been told that it's just the protons plus the neutrons, but actually atomic mass includes 
the mass of the electrons. But the thing is, electrons are so small that they really don't get added into the mass because they make such a, they don't really make that much of a difference. So there's always going to be a large number at the bottom of your chemical symbol, which is what this box is, okay? And that's the actual atomic mass. Now, what we do is we take that number and we round it to the nearest whole number, and that's what we consider to be the atomic mass. Okay, this number in reality is known as the mass number, and that comes from the actual mass. But the atomic mass that we're just going to say is just the protons plus the number of neutrons. So in oxygen's case, there are 16 protons plus neutrons in the nucleus. The other important number is known as the atomic number, and that's the number of protons in an atom. It's found at the top of the chemical symbol. It's an important number because it controls, it controls everything about that atom. Uh, if we change the number of protons, we actually change what that atom can do. Now, the number of electrons and neutrons can vary, but the number of protons can never change, and that's an important idea. Because if I added a proton to oxygen, for example, it would no longer be an 8, it would be a 9 up here, which would mean it's no longer oxygen, but it's actually fluorine, which is the one just to the right of oxygen. So, a quick review. Let's see if we can calculate these numbers. How would I know the number of protons? Well, the number of protons we just learned is equal to the atomic number. How could I figure out the number of neutrons? Well, we said that the atomic mass is protons plus neutrons. So if I take that atomic mass and subtract the atomic number, which is equal to the number of protons, then I get the number of neutrons. And then the number of electrons, since electrons are negative and protons are positive, has to be, these two numbers have to be equal, electrons to protons, in a neutral atom. Now, what if we change the number of neutrons? What happens to the atom? Well, it's no longer really known as an atom, or at least a neutral atom. It's known as what's called an isotope. And believe it or not, there's actually several different types of isotopes out on the planet. Normal carbon, for example, is known as carbon-12 because it has six protons and six neutrons. But the isotope carbon-14 has six protons and eight neutrons. That's important because, believe it or not, it's actually radioactive, which means that it loses pieces of itself over time. And we actually can use carbon-14 to date different fossils and rocks and different things that we find in nature back to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even billions and millions of years if we use the right type of radioactive isotopes. Now, if we change the number of electrons, we call that an ion. An ion is an atom with an electrical charge, meaning that it either has a positive charge or a negative charge. So, for example, sodium here has lost an electron and given it to uh, chlorine. Well, sodium, since it lost a negatively charged electron, now has a positive charge because it would have an extra proton compared to the number of electrons. On the flip side, chlorine, since it gained an electron, now has a negative charge, so it's Cl minus. And we always put a plus or a minus to denote what the chemical charge is. Now, if it lost two electrons or two protons, or excuse me, if it lost two electrons or gained two electrons, then it would be Na2 plus or Cl2 minus or minus 2. Now, quick joke, two hydrogen atoms walk into a bar, first one says, hey, I think I lost an electron. The other one says, are you sure? First one said, yeah, I'm positive. <laughs> uh, I don't hear you laughing. Now, that's funny because that means he's an ion, because he's lost an electron, which has a negative charge. He's now a positively charged hydrogen atom. Yeah, it's, you know it's funny. Okay, uh, before we move on, I need to point something out. These diagrams down below are known as Bohr models. And that doesn't mean they're boring to draw, okay? <laughs> what that means is that they were developed by a Dr. Bohr, a scientist named Bohr. But really what you do is you take these, uh, these elements, you draw a circle in the center to represent the nucleus, and a lot of times you can write the chemical symbol inside there to help identify it. And then you add electron shells based on whatever row it's in. If it's in the first row, it gets one shell. Second row, it gets two. Third row, it gets three. Now, every time you add a shell, that means the shell behind it, or the smaller one, like in, uh, in this case in lithium, has to be completely filled. In other words, the first circle has to have two electrons. If I jump down to sodium below it, since it has three shells, that means the first shell has to be filled with two, the second set shell has to be filled with eight, and then the third shell, obviously, that number of electrons is dependent on whatever row it's in. Okay, Since it's in the first row in this case, it gets one electron in its outer shell. Now, why do atoms bond? Well, atoms want to become happy or stable. 
And they do that by filling up their outermost shell all the way. Okay, it has to be completely filled with electrons to the point where it can't hold any more. Okay, noble gases, for example, the guys over here on the right side, are stable, meaning they don't really bond regular because they don't have electrons to gain or lose. And because they're stable, they don't need to bond. Now, the groups that are most likely to bond are going to be the first group because they have one extra electron and the seventh group because they need one extra electron. So, the fact that these electrons tend to gain or lose electrons gives them an opposite charge and those opposite charges cause them to be attracted to one another. The attraction of positive and negative becomes, uh, excuse me, creates something called an ionic bond. Ionic bond occurs between metals and nonmetals because metals become positively charged because they lose electrons, nonmetals become negatively charged because they gain electrons. Let me show you what I mean. Sodium, for example, is in the first group, which means it has one extra electron or one valence electron. Chlorine has seven valence electrons, which means it's in the group just to the left of the noble gases. So chlorine needs to gain one electron. So it actually steals one from sodium, who's happy to give his away, but that means that sodium now is positively charged and chlorine's negatively charged. Now since positive and negative are attracted, they actually link up together and create salt. So another quick joke, okay, you can see uh, the boys here in this class are flying towards these girls because they're so attracted to them. Now it's not because they have uh, nice makeup on or because they have great personalities, okay, it's actually because they have negative charges and the boys have positive charges. Ha ha ha. Now, what do we call it when uh, elements share electrons? Well, that's known as a covalent bond. Covalent bonds are actually the strongest type of bond, and they occur be to, uh, excuse me, between two nonmetals. So let me show you what I mean. So I've got oxygen here. Oxygen needs two extra electrons to fill its outer shell. Fluorine, on the other hand, only needs one extra electron. Well, if I take two fluorines and bond it with that one oxygen, now you can see all three of them have completely filled up their outer shell. Fluorine has eight, oxygen has eight, and the other fluorine has eight. This is known as F2O, okay, because I have two fluorines and one oxygen, and all three of them are now stable. Hydrogen bonds are the weakest of all the types of bonds. Uh, they're technically a form of covalent bond. Uh, there's actually, they actually be, can become strong if there's lots of them. Hydrogen bonds are what actually hold your water together, uh, and they occur between polar molecules, meaning molecules that where the, uh, excuse me, where the electrons are shared unequally. So in other words, since these two hydrogens are pulled towards the same end of this oxygen, that means that they cause charges on either end of it. But we'll learn more about that tomorrow when we talk about water. So, bonds between atoms. They make molecules and compounds. The difference is molecules are any combination of two or more atoms. So H2O, yep, that counts because there's three different atoms there. O2 would count because there's two oxygens, so O2 is a molecule. Okay, uh, and O2 is a special kind of molecule because it's known as a diatomic element, meaning that in nature you can only find oxygen as O2. You can't just find oxygen as just O. In fact, if you found just O, that's actually poisonous. On the flip side, a compound is any substance consisting of two or more elements uh, so in different uh, ratios. So Na and Cl, okay, that would be a compound because it's two different elements. CHO, uh, in other words, C6H12O6, that would be a compound because it's three different elements. But O2 would not be a compound because it's only one different element. So in other words, all compounds are types of molecules, but not all molecules are compounds. Now, to summarize, there's two key points I want to, or two key things I want to get together with uh, here in this last minute. Uh, you'll notice I've got a, I had a little uh, diagram down here of this. In fact, I'll go back so you can see it again. Okay, this enzyme and substrate, you'll notice that they kind of fit together. Now, this is important and nice typo there, Mr. Kabuski. But both in biology and chemistry, the size and the shape of something directly affects its function in a living cell. Okay, that's going to be an important idea as we go through here, whether we're talking about chemistry, DNA, or even in evolution. Okay, now, like I said, this is just the beginning of your vocabulary list. This is just for basic chemistry. So make sure you know the definitions for each one of these objects. Feel free to go back through these notes, okay? I've got about 10 seconds left. Hope you learned something here in Section 1 of Unit 2. 
and we'll see you next time when we talk about properties of water.